Hare Krishna. So thank you very much for coming today. And I'll speak today on the principle of what goes around comes around. How we are all accountable for our actions. And I'll speak this based on a story from the Ramayana which illustrates this. So before I go into the story, let's look at some principles that all of us operate based on an innate assumption of cause and effect. Say, if your child comes back from school with a black eye and a, and I say, what happened? I just got a black eye. Oh, really? If something must have happened. How did you get a black eye? Did you fight with someone? I've got an infection. What has happened? So whenever we see some effect, we presume there is a cause. Mm -hmm. And conversely, whenever there is a cause, we understand that there will be an effect. Say a child may not be studying, a child may say, I'm happy. But if you don't study now, you cannot stay happy in future. You have a life ahead. So even if the effect is not immediately seen, we understand the effect is there. Now this cause and effect principle applies in our day-to-day -day experience of living and intelligence means to pursue the cause and effect even when it is not immediately visible. Even science operates on this principle itself. When Newton saw the fruit falling, a few years ago I was invited to Cambridge University to speak. So while going there we passed by the same tree. It's supposed to be still there. So it is that tree is like a pilgrimage place for scientists. So they go there and they get inspiration. How brilliant was Newton? So does anyone know what happened under that tree? The apple fell. Where? Yes. Some people say it in front of him. Some people say it fell on him. On his head. And so when the apple fell, Newton asked a question. The question was, what made this apple fall? And it's his brilliance that he came up with the principle of gravity based on that. But still the question itself, what made this apple fall, means that there is no, that there is an implicit assumption that apples don't fall by chance. There is some mechanism. Let me understand the mechanism. Science itself is a search for the mechanisms that govern, mechanisms, principles that govern the functioning of nature around us. So whether in day-to-day -day experience or in science, we implicitly assume the principle of cause and effect. And even when sometimes we cannot find the effect for a particular cause or we can't find the cause of a particular effect, even at that time, although it's confusing, disheartening, but we don't lose faith in the principle of cause and effect. So sometimes when bad things happen to good people, atheists ask this question that if God is good, they consider the problem of evil to be like a knockout punch. You know, because God is supposed to be good, but there is so much bad in this world. Therefore, how can God exist? So we can turn this question around and say that atheists say, why, should good, why, why do bad things happen to good people? We can turn it around and ask, why should bad things not happen to good people? What do you mean? Obviously, good things should happen to good people, bad things to bad people. But why? If we are simply biological machines geared for survival, then in nature, there is no such thing as good things happening to good people and bad things happening to bad people. Nature survives. Nature functions where might is right. You know, if a wolf is, wolf is strong and a chicken is weak, the wolf will catch the chicken, even the chicken is very good, isn't it? So the whole idea of good and bad should lead to good and bad. Within a purely atheistic worldview, there is no basis for it. So the, we may ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And atheists may try to put us on the defensive. But we can put them on the defensive by asking, why should bad things not happen to good people? 
why should good things lead to good results within atheism there is no explanation for this that's how it should be but why so the point which i'm making here is that even atheist atheist also assumes that actually good things should have that they also assume the existence of cause and effect and they also try to make sense oh this makes sense because of this this makes sense because of this but atheism is so ironical that atheists basically end up searching for islands of meaning while drowning in ocean of meaninglessness <laughs> <laughs> what is the island of meaning oh why do fruits fall it's because of gravity oh why does uh, why does uh, things why does metal pass some electricity because it's conducting because it's a conductor so we have explanation in terms of cause and effect for many things within existence but for existence itself there is no explanation why do we exist at all why are we born why do we live why do we die there's no meaning for it so atheism is ironical in that way that we even atheists even an atheist a hardcore atheist will not grow up their children saying that actually everything is meaningless there is no correlation of cause and effect whether you study or not what marks you will get it's all chance yes. <laughs> nobody trains their children like that you know you work hard then you will succeed in life now it's possible that sometimes we may work hard and we may not succeed now these exceptions are what raise the question and yes that question needs to be addressed but first the exception requires a foundation and theism may struggle to explain the exception but atheism fails to explain explain the foundation itself of which this is an exception is this point am i making it clear so now we could ask this question that yeah okay why do bad things because bad things happen to good people so therefore there is no god there is no cause effect connection everything is by chance everything is meaningless no even if something doesn't make sense to us we never lose faith in cause and effect i hey, suppose we have some say some some swelling or some pain or something and we go to a doctor and the doctor says with a dreadful diagnosis we hear you have got cancer <sighs> now one of the reasons why cancer is so scary is of course because it can be fatal but also because its cause is very difficult to determine sometimes you just don't know what the cause is but if once we go over the denial and the shock the next thing we ask the doctor is is it treatable how can we treat it now as soon as we ask is the cancer treatable that means we are implicitly accepting again cause effect connection okay i don't know what cause co led to this cancer as a effect but still i believe in cause and effect that means if i take this medicine as a cause the effect of this cancer will go away so nobody can function by totally rejecting the cause effect connection so the principle of cause effect is foundational for our very existence in this world for any kind of functioning in this world see all of you are sitting now now every one of you is reasonably confident and the person next to you will not suddenly turn up at you and slap you in the face <laughs> now uh, you could say it's possible is it <laughs> but it's not probable why is it not probable because there's no cause for it you know why would you, or if somebody did like it first why did you slap me isn't it that's a question we would ask so we generally function based on a presumption of cause effect correlation now when some cause effect correlation doesn't make sense then we need to expand our frame of reference so everything that we see we see within particular frames of reference say for example right now you're sitting and suddenly this light goes off and the first thing you look has somebody accidentally pressed the switch so we bet we put this light in the connection with the frame that's one frame 
the, the one cause could be that okay somebody the power has the power switch has been accidentally turned off another could be oh maybe this this particular light has got uh, spoiled another could be oh maybe has the power in this whole area gone off or could it be that america has been attacked by terrorists and the power plants over here have been all stopped <laughs> or could it be that there has been sudden solar flare on the sun this is a possibility that if a solar flare comes too close to the earth's atmosphere the the insertion of energy into the earth's atmosphere will cause all electrical and electronic equipment on the earth to stop functioning so you could escalate the frame of reference a light going off on the earth to a flare coming from the sun it's remote but the point is we ourselves do this calibration say if the power goes off it, it doesn't fit in this frame of reference is that switch off or is this got spoiled or is the power gone off so we ourselves for functioning everything we put in different frames of reference and say for example right now i'm giving a class and suddenly i start coughing then i may think okay has something gone in my mouth or something or is there something in the atmosphere over here because of which i'm coughing or is it that i have got cough if something is in the atmosphere then i'll say can you just stop that sometimes some people have allergy to incense or some kind of smoke can you please stop that or if i have got some uh, some cold or cough i may say can you please switch off this fan or i may ask can you give me some ginger water or some something like that that can help me deal with my throat so basically if i start getting cold or cough i can put it in different frames of reference and based on that frame of reference whether it is the atmosphere whether it is the electric uh, the temperature whether it is the health itself we will find different solutions so basically when one frame of reference doesn't work then we try to put things in another frame of reference and then another frame of reference and then we try to put things in that frame of reference which makes sense so what the dharmic texts tell us that when we don't see the cause effect connection that simply means we haven't found the right frame of reference so when some person is doing good and getting bad as a result that simply means that we have to look at a bigger frame of reference uh, karma is not just one to one correspondence it is also cumulative see every action has a reaction but the reaction may not come immediately just as a simple example suppose say you have a credit uh, credit arrangement with some nearby mall or supermarket some big shop then so throughout the month you pay you buy some things and you have to pay only at the end of the month the, at the end of the month say three friends go there and all of them purchase some 2 dollar worth some food item and come out but when they come out one of them gets a 2 dollar bill another gets a 200 dollar bill another gets a 2000 dollar bill hey what's going on all of us purchase the same thing but the difference is the bill you are getting is not just for what you purchase at that time it is for what you purchase at that time and what you purchase throughout the month so yes from the immediate frame of reference you could say i just took such as 2 dollars worth and you gave me 2000 dollars it's outrageous but what you are getting is not just for what you have purchased so karma is there is a one to one correspondence in karma but the way karma unfolds is not based on one to one correspondence alone mm -hmm. so that's how sometimes so some so somebody has say negative credit somebody has a positive credit they may just pay they may they may not pay anything and still they can get a 2000 dollar worth item and they can walk out without paying anything isn't it so you can see this practically in life also that sometimes some people uh, uh, their digestive system and their health is very fragile if they eat something a little bit wrong then immediately their health gets spoiled and sometimes the the they sometimes they just eat a little bit more and their body balloons out and then they say i am out of shape actually even round is a shape 
<laughs> but still, uh, there are some other people, they treat their tongue like a conveyor belt. <laughs> <laughs> they eat anything and everything and still they remain not healthy and fit also. They look also still slim and attractive. So what is going on? You know? Now what we eat does have an effect. But if somebody by their past karma is meant to have a sickly body in this life, then a small cost, small imbalance in eating like a $2 item you purchase, you get a $2,000 bill. <laughs> Somebody else by their past karma has meant to get a healthy body. So it's like they purchase a $2,000 item and they get a $2 bill. Or they don't have to pay any bill at all. So it's not that they don't have to pay, but it's just that they don't have to pay now. So cause effect is, exists, but it can be delayed. So normal, the normal frame of reference would be, then okay, I pay this much amount, I, I buy this much item, this for, and I pay that much amount. But you put in the bigger frame of reference, I might pay a small, I might buy a small item and pay a big amount, or I might buy a big item and pay a small amount. So that's because you have to look at the big picture. So, so similarly, what the what the Vedic scriptures tell us is that if we expand the frame of reference, then the cause effect can start making sense. So if somebody is doing good and getting bad, we have to look at the previous lives. Maybe in the previous life they have some, done something bad, whose reactions are coming now. Or somebody is getting bad, doing bad and getting good. That means that or somebody, is doing, somebody is doing bad and getting good, that means in the previous life they have done some good karma. And that's why the results are not coming immediately. So we need to expand the frame of reference. And that's why the, to understand how God is good, the concept of the Atma and reincarnation are very important. Without that, Christians find it very, very difficult. They accept God. Say so it's like there are two prominent branches of religion. You have say Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and Buddhism. So these are called the Abrahamic religions, and this is Buddhism. So Christianity accepts the soul without reincarnation. Buddhism accepts reincarnation without the soul. <laughs> so, Christians accept the soul, but no reincarnation. Uh, that's why they, they find it very difficult. Okay, uh, how? Why? Why? Because the child, say sometimes some children from birth itself have a lot of medical complications. They just can't explain because the child has no previous life, so no previous karma. This is the this is first, first and only, you have only one life according to them. So why does this happen? Just find it very, very difficult to explain that. Conversely, in a Buddhist, they basically Buddhism was like a rebel child of Hinduism. <laughs> so a rebel child means what? <laughs> rebel child means that sometimes a child doesn't want to tell their surname. Because they don't want to identify with their family. Sometimes they change their name also. So Buddhism emerged from Hinduism, but it was, it was, a, it was a rebel child. So they tried to change certain doctrines. And one of the doctrines of Hinduism that they rejected was Atma. But for 2500 years, Buddhist philosophers have been struggling to explain if there is no soul, then what is it that reincarnates? So they say just as some scars which are accumulated together and they reincarnate. Thank you. So the so the point here I'm making is we need an expanded frame of reference to make sense of things. Mm -hmm. So this was the background for the class. The background went a little longer, but any questions about this till now? So the main point is to understand cause. Nobody rejects cause and effect. Everybody presumes it, but when we don't make sense of, when we don't see the cause of connection, we need to expand the frame of reference to understand it. Okay. So I'll move on to a story from the Ramayana which illustrates this. See, Ram was a, uh, Ravan is an example of a person who, by past karmic, by past credits, is meant to have. 
was meant to have power. Am I audible behind? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. So, by past karma, he had some powers. And he, different characters in the scriptures represent different anarthas. So, Ravan embodies which anartha? Ravan embodies which weakness? Which weakness? Last, yes. So, he, now his abduction of Sita was the last act that he did. But before that, he had done many, many atrocious things. So, once he had, he was, he was going on a conquest of the universe and he was wandering through the Himalayas. He was going in his pushpak, which he had stolen, the flying airplane which he had stolen from his cousin Kuvera. And he was going along, the, below the nature was beautiful. But when somebody is in, having a little sattva, they can appreciate nature's beauty. But somebody in Rachas, say, nature is too peaceful. I want some stimulation. <laughs> so, I want some stimulation. You know, there are some people who say that video games can also enhance attention and ability of people, of children. Now, yes, you could say so, but broadly speaking, there are two kinds of attention. There is reactive attention and there is focused intentional attention. <coughs> reactive attention means something changes rapidly and that's how you focus on it. So, what happens when people play video games or they watch videos or they watch movies? They are very attentive. <laughs> when they are watching a movie, completely absorbed in it. But that attention is because so many stimuli are coming up on the screen. That they, they, so, it, that attention is reactive attention. In general, life is not that fast. So, when our reactive attention increases, then, in one sense, we may feel there's a lot of attention. But that attention is a response to a high level of stimulation. But because life is not that stimulating, so the people get bored with life. And the capacity for intentional attention. That means there's not, nothing, like if, they, if you are hearing a talk. Now, some speakers can be very dramatic. But in general, normal human conversations and normal human talks are not like high stimulating talks. So it requires concentration, requires focus. And that capacity for intentional attention decreases. And that's why uh, children get things like ADHD, you know, attention hyperactivity disorders. Because it's not that they don't have attention. It's that whatever they are focusing on that is no longer attractive enough to retain their attention. So, sometimes video games can also have a lot of variables, okay, get this car, get this, shoot this particular thing or take the car through this or do that, do that. There's a lot of thought, attention and planning required to play video games also. But it's primarily reactive attention. So, reactive attention does not help us in life so much. It can lead to some kind of intellectual development, development of the brain, but only a particular way. The point I'm making is that Ravan was flying and for him, <coughs> now if you just see the Himalayas from the ground also, it is beautiful. But if you see from the sky, it's a magnificent view. But for him, it was too peaceful, too boring, he wanted some action. <coughs> yeah, possible. You put it in the right frame of reference. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so he was looking for some action. And as he was going through the sky, suddenly he noticed something below some action. He saw it's a beautiful woman. Oh, what is the woman doing over here? Immediately, his eyes became like radars. Looking, what happened? And immediately he got his plane to descend. He looked around. So it's a breathtakingly beautiful woman. He came and started looking around. Now, what is the woman doing alone over here? Does she have any protector? Say, I'll deal with that even if he's there. And then he came down. 
And then he saw that this woman was a yogini. She was sitting in a yogic posture with closed eyes, intoning the mantra. Oh, oh, oh. And as he looked at her, she became more and more captivated by her. And he got off his chariot and started approaching her. Now, she sensed his approach and she opened his eyes. And he changed into an attractive human form. That time, Ravan could assume that ten-headed form and he could assume a normal form also. So, and he came there and he asked her, he says, Oh, oh maiden, oh, beautiful maiden, what are you doing alone in this forest over here? He says, and he, now she saw him as a guest who has come there. And she offered normal hospitality. She says that, actually, I am the daughter of the great sage Kushadvaja. My name is Vedavati. And I am doing tapasya here to get Vishnu as my husband. And as she completed this, she started speaking also. Her voice was also so attractive. So Ravan got more and more incited by that. And then when he heard Vishnu, he said, oh, Vishnu is my competitor. So if somebody says competitor, then what happens? See, uh, then he thought that if I, if I can't defeat Vishnu, I will take something which is meant for Vishnu. So his desire to get Vedavati increased even more. And then he told her that I am Ravan. I am the king of the demons and I preside over a magnificent kingdom in Lanka. Just come with me, become my wife and I will make you the principal queen of Lanka. You can live in prosperity. I have a city of gold. So he started bragging about his wealth and power to attract her. And she said, O oh king, he says, I have set my heart on Vishnu. No one, I am not interested in anyone else. <coughs> Please return the way you have come. I cannot fulfill your desire. Still very polite. But Ravan just laughed internally. He says that, he says that she, she thinks that I am making a... See, some people, when they make a proposal, it's not a proposal. It's an instruction just masquerading as a proposal. <laughs> it's a demand masquerading as a proposal. So... What happened when he said that? He said, he, is, he just marched towards her to grab her. Now, Vedvati was also sharp. Uh, she, she immediately recognized his intention and tried to move away. He caught her by the hair. And as soon as he caught her by the hair to pull her, she immediately, suddenly, Ravana was about to pull her and he was thinking, I'll grab her and uh, in my arms right turn. Suddenly he found, he just, he just thrown back and he just had a tuft of hair, just a tuft of hair in his hands. But he looked and he saw that this uh, Vedavati had used her hands with a mystic power like a sword and she had cut off the hair. So she was, he was just left with the hair and she was standing. He says, oh wicked one, he says, you have defiled me by your evil touch. This body is no longer pure enough to offer to Vishnu. He says, because you have defiled me, I will return to destroy you and I will ultimately attain Lord Vishnu. And as Ravana was just uh, amazed and watching, things happened so fast. She closed her eyes and suddenly a mystic fire came from her body. And that, it, her own body gave out the fire and she immolated herself in that fire. And as Ravana walked away disappointed, he didn't even pay much attention to the thought that she said, I will return and I will destroy you. But he did not know that this attempt to violate a woman, how much it would cost her in the future. Now this Vedavati, she came back as Maya Sita. She is known as Maya Sita or Chaya Sita, both of them. So in that case, Ravan seemed to you know, he tried to molest someone, he got away with it. But every action has its reaction. So when he cast his evil eye on Sita, at that time, Lakshman, before he had gone out to be with Ram, he had made a Lakshman Rekha. And what happened was, 
it was a mystical boundary like sometimes in some houses you have electrical fencing the, the there can be barbed fencing but there can be barbed and electrical fencing so bars will cut but the electrical fencing will burn it's still going so that lakshman rekha was like a mystical fencing which anybody would step on it a step across it they would get burnt so that's how uh, lakshman had arranged for sita's protection and ravan when he came again he had uh, put on the gar different garb of a saintly person and he came there when he couldn't come in he told sita sita said just please wait for some time my husband will come and then I'll, we will serve you she said, no i am very hungry she said please give me some food <laughs> right away and now she but how can i refuse a saintly person like this so she came out and when ravan was trying to come in he was getting burned when sita stepped toward that lakshman rekha the fire came there also but she went into the fire and came out of the fire and it seemed that the fire didn't affect her but actually in that stepping into the fire and out of the fire a mystical switch happened the switch was sita went to agni dev and went to mortal vision to our vision vedavati had been burnt but vedavati there was no body and no ashes left vedavati just disappeared so at that time vedavati had gone to agni so what happened from here to here this is this is the fence then sita came in from here and she did not come out from here she actually went to agni and agni brought vedavati and vedavati came out now vedavati was given a form exactly like sita so normally when we say karma as action reaction it's not literally always one to one correspondence sometimes the reactions to our actions may come in different way from the way we had in the action so just for indicative purposes we may say that say for example if somebody kills a cow then it is said that what will happen if somebody kills a cow what is the karmic reaction for that yeah but basically basic principle is that we say that they will become a cow and they will be killed isn't it now you know you could twist this logic and say that that means all those who are cows now they must have been cow killers in the past <laughs> that's a wrong logic that is not the right logic at all because in logic this is called as the error of the antecedent if if a leads to b so if a leads to b and then if you say b is present that does not necessarily mean a was present before that so if i say that if it rains then the pavement will be wet so if a leads to b so tomorrow morning if i wake up and find the pavement to be wet that does not necessarily mean it could have it has rained maybe somebody was carrying water and they spilled the water maybe somebody was watering the lawn and the water spilled over onto the pavement maybe there was a leakage in the water supply and that's how that it came up so we cannot twist it that way if a then b does not mean if b then a so that so if somebody is a cow slaughterer that they, it means we could say that they become a cow and then they may kill big they may kill by cows but that does not mean all cows are cow slaughterers from the past that's a completely twisted understanding Hmm? and even this is indicative it is not that every cow slaughterer will become a cow and they will be killed basically they will get the pain that they have inflicted on others now how exactly that pain will come will vary so ravan inflicted the pain on vedavati and on so many other women and now all those women, all that karma came back to him so see when we have a particular craving uh, the craving itself is painful the craving is like a fire now of course the nature of the material mind is such that it starts envisioning that that craving to be enjoyable then in many hindi movies or something they write songs lovers write saavan jo aag lagaye something like that you know that the fire of desire that is created in us now they also acknowledge it is fire 
There's ark. They call it is desire. It's fire. But they think by union that that fire will get extinguished. Well, it gets extinguished temporarily, but it comes back again after that. So what happened? That fire can also be a great pain, especially if we desire something very strongly, and then we can't get it. It that desire burns like fire within us. At least a normal fire burns and gets over. But the fire of desire keeps burning and burning and burning and burning. So what happened to Ravan was that he abducted Sita. He abducted Vedvati, who he thought was Sita. And Vedvati was given all the knowledge and the ability by which she could function. Not only she had the looks of Sita, but she would also function exactly like Sita. And he was craving, 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 craving for her. In the meanwhile, he had also, after he had tried to uh, violate Vedvati, he had also violated another celestial woman, Ramba. And at that time, Ramba's husband had cursed that because he had been given immunity by Brahma's boon, so he, says he could not curse him to die. But he said, if you do this thing again to any other woman, you will be killed. And Brahma came over there and he told that you don't have... He says that... My boons, my boon will give you immunity from attack by enemies. It is not going to give you immunity from curses. So from that time he could not, he, he dared not force any woman. So although Sita was with him, Sita, she was close, but she was always unattainable for him. And day after day, night after night, he burned in that fire of lust. And that fire tormented him. And the fire of unsatisfied desire can be an unbearable torment. He just couldn't do anything. He couldn't. It's like, it's like we are fighting a battle that we can't win and that we can't quit. Suppose somebody is a box, in a boxing match. You know, and there's a tiny person and there's a big boxer on the other side. And this person gets beaten, gets beaten, gets beaten, but, but they told you cannot leave this boxing ring. What do you do? Get beaten, knock down, get up, again get beaten. So, having this desire burning within us is like that. We can't stop the, we can't, uh, we can't win the war, we can't quit the war. We just get beaten. So, Ravan was tormented like that, continuously. Constantly he was thinking, when, 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 when. But he just couldn't detain her. So it is all, all the karmic suffering that he had caused, he got it all back. It was not just that he got at the time of death, when he was killed. That was the conclusion. He got a lot of suffering before that also. And eventually, so many times he thought, he thought that maybe, you know, maybe that curse will not work. Maybe that curse might just be a hoax. I'll go and I'll go and do what I want with Sita. But then he said, no. I don't want to. You know, if I go and try to I try to do something and then that curse kills me. He said, I look like a fool. And I have the whole universe will laugh at me. I can't do that. So he was tormented, tormented, tormented constantly. And then what happens? See, the more Sometimes we may feel that if somebody has a good karma buffer, then they can do a lot of bad and still they don't get any bad reactions. Uh, then is it, um, I mean, they just, at least in this life, they're getting scot free. But actually it's not like that. If somebody has a good <coughs> karma buffer, then that means they have wealth or they have power, they have position, they have influence. And then that means that if they do something bad, that bad can have catastrophic effects on others also. So if we hate someone, you know, we might just hurt that person. But when Hitler hated someone, you know, he caused the death of 12 million people. Now, that was just the Holocaust. And apart from that, the war also was there. So many people were killed. That just the Holocaust itself, the gas chambers killed 12 million people. So the so what happened? So it's one thing the past bad the. It's our own evil desires are there. 
whatever Ravan had. But then, if he has greater power and greater influence, then those evil desires affect not only him, but all those around him. So, because of Ravana's evil desire, and because of his karmic position that he had that power, that meant that he actually caused the destruction of his whole dynasty. His brother, his sons, his cousins, his uncle, so many of his generals and soldiers, all of them. So that retribution came to him. He was tormented day after day, month after month. And then eventually he saw every one of them getting destroyed, one after another after another. And finally, you know, Ram and Ravan fought. I mean, they're fighting, fighting, fighting. Initially, of course, we know that Ram shot at his ne head, neck and cut off his neck, but his head kept coming, cut off his head, but his head kept coming back. Then Vibhishan told him, shoot at his chest, shoot at his heart. But still he was waiting, waiting. Ram was not shooting. So it described that what happened, that Ravan had Sita in his heart. And Ram thought, how can I shoot at Sita? So he's waiting, waiting, waiting. And he was playing with Ravan. Ravan was shooting and he was shooting back and he was completely countering and defeating and humiliating but not killing him. And finally, Ravan, for a moment, he, now Sita was in his heart, that was not out of love, that was out of lust. But still Sita was there. But finally started thinking, you know, Kumbhakaran was killed, Indrajit was killed. He started thinking and he said, for just a brief moment, as he thought of all those people who had been killed, till that point his desire was for Sita was so great that he said, whoever is killed, I want Sita. But finally he saw that, that last day when he had gone for the war, he had gone with, all, with his last regiment and almost all his generals were killed now. The last few soldiers were remaining as fighting and he thought, the proud army of Lanka, everything has been destroyed. And for that one moment, the lust in his heart was replaced by anger. And in that anger at the death of all his loved ones, Sita disappeared. And as soon as Sita disappeared, Ram shot the arrow. That arrow went thudded into his heart. And that person who had terrorized the whole universe, he crashed back. He gave a roar that shook the earth. But then he fell on the earth, never to shake again. That was the end of Ravan. So what goes around, comes around. Now how it will come, when it will come, that will vary. But once we understand this principle of cause and effect, we don't worry so much about why something is happening to someone. Oh, this person... We may feel that this person is not working so hard, but they are getting so much fame, they are getting so much credit, they are getting earning so much. And I am working so hard, nobody gives me any credit, nobody, see, nobody, I don't earn so much. See, almost everyone feels, almost, this is a un, almost a universal psychological attribute. Almost everyone feels underappreciated. <laughs> everyone feels underappreciated. So, and usually the person whom we are most envious of, we feel they are overappreciated. <laughs> like say, suppose we sing nicely, but people don't praise us. And then somebody else sings very nicely, then maybe we think not as nicely as me, but still they sing, but they get a lot of praise. Then what we do is, if they sing very nicely and if people praise them, you know, they sing so nicely. Have you seen how much Prasad he eats? <laughs> So if we find some way to criticize them and pull them down. They don't deserve so much praise. You know? <laughs> but we have to understand that if somebody is getting a lot of praise, it is not just because of what they are doing right now. And if we are not getting praise, it is, it doesn't, now it's not that we want praise. It's just at one level, appreciation is just a matter of reciprocation. Now, if we are doing some service, if it is recognized, we feel encouraged. Yes, am I doing something good? I want, I'll continue with them. So it's a normal human need also. But sometimes, if it is not coming, we don't have to get into a zone where we create further karma. Sometimes we may be doing the right thing, but may not be getting the right result. 
that doesn't mean the right thing is all waste the right thing is valuable and it will give its result and if you're doing something bad even if you feel that nothing is going wrong actually it is going wrong the consequences are going to come like say you know one of my friends he he does this not a devotee but he is he's a adventure he like jumps from airplanes helicopters you know that what is it called bungee jumping or what is it so he does that jumping skydiving, skydiving yeah so he does skydiving and he said that actually the initial part that you're just falling down it's so you're going down with such speed and you can feel the wind in your ears and you can see the earth coming to you this is first time it is scary but after that it becomes actually enjoyable you can just feel that and then eventually the parachute opens and then you come down slowly but it says that when you are coming down as so when you were telling me this it struck me that if you are coming down and if your parachute is not going to open suppose <laughs> then you might be enjoying while you are coming down <laughs> but once you really come down you will be panicking <laughs> and then you will be destroyed so like that sometimes if we may be doing something wrong also and so they not getting any result that simply means you know we jump from the parachute but it's just that we are not yet hitting the ground so actions do have consequences and of course as devotees we don't have to live in fear eh? is some bad karma reaction going to come to me is this going to happen what is going to happen we want to be more krishna conscious than karma conscious if we focus focus on serving krishna whatever bad karma is there krishna will help us to deal with it and whatever good karma is there krishna will help us to do it in a spiritual way so that we don't get bound by it so we focus on serving krishna but sometimes if we feel that even while serving krishna i am not getting what i feel i deserve then we don't have to get too much carried away by that feeling because every action that we are doing it can it will give results if not immediately then eventually so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on the topic of what goes around comes around started by <clears throat> talking about how cause effect is universally presumed by us in our day to day conduct and that is a foundational presumption even in science in fact intelligence means to see the cause effect even when it is not immediately visible and some athe atheists may ask that why do bad things happen to good people and yes that's a valid question but atheism itself does not have any foundation for this cause effect correlation why should bad things not happen to good people if atheism were true the nature will operate simply on the principle of might is right not on any ethical principle so so we may have theism may have problem in explaining the exceptions but atheism has a problem in explaining the foundation itself foundation principle of cause and effect and even atheists what happens is they don't reject the cause effect principle completely what they delight in finding islands of meaning while drowning in an ocean of meaninglessness oh, this works like this way this works this way this works this way this works this way Th but life is meaningless ultimately so it doesn't make any sense and nobody is functionally a rejecter of cause effect connection no parent will raise their child and saying that there is no cause effect correlation in life even when cause effect correlation doesn't make sense still we don't lose faith in it even if we get a disease for which cause we don't know so immediately we look for a treatment that means we accept cause effect principle so to find the cause effect uh, principle, cause effect correlation we need to put events in the right frame of reference just like if power goes off then is it the, the power has switch has been turned on the bulb has gone off the power supply has gone off the country is under attack or a solar flare has come to the earth it could expand the frame of reference to find where in mean, which frame of reference this makes the best sense so similarly action reaction there is correlation but it's not a immediate one to one correspondence always so we might buy a 2 dollar item and get 2000 dollar bill or buy a 2000 dollar item and get no bill on is a 2 dollar bill it's because based on what kind of credit we have over there so similarly sometimes some people may eat healthily and still 
and lead a little unhealthy and fall sick. Some people may eat a lot of unhealthy things and still remain healthy. That's the past karmic buffer that is there. Then I talked about Ravana's story to explain this, uh, how this, we, the expanded frame of reference of previous life helps us to make sense of things. In Christianity, they accept the soul but no reincarnation. That's why they can't explain the problem of evil. Buddhism accepts reincarnation but no soul. That's why they can't explain uh, what, what is it that reincarnates. But uh, in the Ramayana story, I discuss how Ravan had a karmic buffer because of which he did not get the immediate reaction for all his monstrous wrongdoings. But the Vedavati whom he tried to violate, she came back as the Maya Sita. And so when uh, I talked about when Ravan was going through the Himalayas, he did not find the Himalayas very attractive because he was in so much passion, rajas. I talked about video games must increase our reactive attention, but it doesn't increase our intentional attention. And the Ravana's reaction was not just the death at the end of his life which Ram, Ram inflicted. It was also the torment of unfulfilled desire which his craving for Sita inflicted on him. So when we have a too strong a craving, it's like a game which we can't, boxing match we can't win and we can't quit. It's like a fire that keeps burning, burning, burning within us. So that is also a great torment for him. And the greater the good karma somebody has done in the past, the better the position they will be in. Now at one level that may insulate them from their past karmic reactions, but that can also mean that they can do far worse karma in this life. So if an ordinary person hates someone or a big dictator hates someone, dictator can do far greater harm. So Ravan's evil desires not only caused him to die, not only caused him to be tormented, but the result was all those who were around him, they were also killed. And eventually Ravan himself fell. So then I talk, concluded by that in our lives, if sometimes we are doing good if you are sometimes not getting the credit for it or the result for it, we shouldn't become discouraged. We just put in the bigger frame of reference and we continue our uh, doing our duty and our bhakti. And if you are doing bad and somebody seems to be getting away, then it's just like they are falling but they are not yet come close to the ground. After moving out of a, of a, jumping out of an airplane. If, and can, we don't have to be so much fearful of what karma is going to hit me when. We, be, we are not karma conscious but Krishna conscious. If we stay conscious of Krishna, then He will protect us from whatever bad karmic reactions are going to come upon us or He will give us the strength to deal with them. And whatever good karma inclined we are to, to do, He will help us to spiritualize it. So, whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. <laughs> whatever, Hare Krishna. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yes, please. So, Vedavati was in Lanka. Hmm. So, when did she turn to Sita? Is it when uh, Sita entered into Agni again? To exactly, yes. So, so, what happened to Vedavati then when she emerged into it? Yeah, Vedavati, uh, when did Vedavati change into Sita? It was when the Agni Pariksha was done. At that time, again, Vedavati entered from one side and she went to Agni, and Agni came, uh, Agni returned Sita. So, it was Sita who came from the other side. So, it was not so much. Uh, her purity that was being tested, but rather she was being returned, and that the the excuse of testing her purity was just the that was just the external reason. Then Vedavati, in that particular manifestation of the Lord, she was not destined to be united with Ram. She had to do uh, sometimes bahunam, jidmanam, ante gyan, maan, maan, prapadyate. And attaining the Lord can take many lifetimes. So it is a later lifetime when the Lord appears as Balaji. At that time. One of his consorts is Vedavati who is returned. So that's that's why we say Balaji has two consorts, you know, and this Bhumi Devi, Sri Devi like that. So one of them is Sita, the other is Vedavati. Okay, that's when he unites, he unites with him. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Any other questions? Yes, please. We understand that there is cause and effect. Like uh, we know, it's everything we get is good and bad is based on karma. We understand the philosophy and everything and when we start any work or any good thing in our life, first we our mindset is like, okay, whether if it's if it's there in our karma, then we'll get it or no. But when you suppose it's a good result, obviously mind gives you happiness and everything is there. But when suppose it's not what we desire for, like 
it comes it's like different from what we designed maybe it's like that is not working out mm. then uh, first first uh, comes to the mind is that why i'm not getting it again it takes some lectures some reaching to come to the point again that this is based on karma so as soon as any situation happens in life how we should cultivate that this is like this is what karma is like whether good mm. or bad so it takes a lot of time for mind to adjust to this concept again that is true situation. What that is true. Yeah, so, that? how can we cultivate that understanding that results that we are getting are not necessarily because of our our actions alone? So, we do, if we don't get what we deserve, if we get something bad when we have done something good. How can we learn to immediately accept that as karma rather than need to hear some philosophy to understand it? See, it's not necessary that we always have to resort to past karma only. It's like say, suppose on a cold night, somebody eats 10 ice creams. Hmm? And then the next morning, they have a terrible throat and they say, ice cream. <laughs> now, their terrible throat, is it because of past karma? Yeah, past night karma. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not that everything that happens to us is just because of past karma. There is a combination of present karma and past karma which comes together in giving us certain results. That's why uh, we have to be practical also. That means if I am doing something if and I am not getting the result, then is there something that I could do to improve it? We should think about it. We should not think just it's past karma. You know, that, that will, you see, uh, in one sense, over-reliance on past karma as an explanation will make us very passive and fatalistic. And over-reliance over on present karma will make us very insecure and volatile. Because every failure we'll start taking it too personally. Mm. So, if I don't do well in an exam, sometimes it may be that I, I may not have studied, but I have studied well, but still I didn't do well in an exam. You know, in relationship, sometimes it happens that people try to form a relationship and it doesn't work. It could be that there's something wrong with me, but sometimes it's just that the other person is, um, other person is at fault. We shouldn't presume that. But sometimes it can be like that. Sometimes some people are just abusive, some people are terrible people. So then something doesn't work out, uh, especially in today's culture where people have dating and everything. And if somebody breaks up with them, people feel so insecure after that. Maybe I am unloved, I will be unlovable. And people become very insecure. One of the top 10 fears of people in today's world is the fear of rejection. And I form a relationship and I may get rejected by someone. So, uh, you know, we, if we rely too much on present karma, then what happens? Our life becomes very volatile. We become very unstable because we take everything very personally. But sometimes things don't have to be taken so personally. So, uh, basically, we have, to, I said, put things in the right frame of reference. So, normally, the immediate cause effect is the first frame of reference. Mm -hmm. So, suppose if I go for a program somewhere and there is nobody there for the program. Now, I could take it personally and say, I am such a poor speaker that nobody comes. Now, that could be true. But, suppose, uh, suppose that program has been done at a place where at the same time there is some other big event going on and everybody has gone there. Then, I have to look at, okay, put it in that context. Put it in that context. So, I remember I went for a program in one country and the host, he invited me in, he said, actually I am going for that program, you can sit, whoever comes, they will attend this class. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was quite uh, humbling. <laughs> So, but uh, you don't have to necessarily take everything too personally. So, we have basically, rather than thinking of 
a right explanation or wrong explanation so if we do something and we get some result now is it because of our present karma or past karma now rather than trying to get too much into that analysis we focus on the more trying to find the most constructive frame of reference in which to put it it's not that one frame of reference is right and the other is wrong we don't know in these cases what is right and what is wrong but what is the most constructive frame of reference so if i have done something and i have not done it so well then the most constructive reference frame of reference is okay let me take care of this in future but if i have done the best that i can and still the result is not coming and the most constructive frame of reference is yeah there is some past karma involved uh, then let me move on now moving on also we will have to use our intelligence to decide okay should i keep doing this keep doing this and if we have given a reasonable amount of tries for that and that is not working maybe that's not meant to work maybe we need to move to something else then so rather than trying to simply uh, resign the results to past karma alone we try to place things in the most constructive frame of reference so that we can move on in our life does that answer your question thank you any other questions there's one question yeah please uh, so prabhu you mentioned a lot about cause and effect so um many times in lectures we hear about causeless mercy is there any cause for causeless mercy <laughs> <laughs> good question is there a cause for causeless mercy yes and no as the very word causeless indicates that it doesn't have any cause but what it means is that the cause is not required for the result as a precondition but that does not mean that there is no cause at all so i'll give an example once prabhupad uh, was going for a morning walk and they were passing by a lake and there they saw uh, it was in america i think and they saw a man feeding the ducks in the lake so now this man was just throwing crumbs to all the ducks but there was one duck that is quacking quacking very loudly 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 and then this man was putting more crumbs toward that duck so prabhupad said this is how we attract krishna's mercy <laughs> <laughs> now now this now if you see from the person's perspective that person is completely independent to which which duck it feeds you know the quack the the ducks quack quick quacking is not the cause of the person's feeding the duck might quit quacking quacking and the person might just walk away from there also or the person is completely independent you could say so but there is a reciprocal relationship and because this person is quack this duck was quacking more so that person was giving more but sometimes they may not give sometimes the duck might just be noisy and quacking more and the person may choose not to give more so there is a reciprocal relationship but it is not always a proportional relationship it is not necessary that we have to do this much and we will get that much in the bible there is a story there is a wealthy person who was passing by an area and he saw there some people were sitting very glumly over there so what happened he said that we are workers in the field but our our field had no crops so we have no work now he said come and work for me and i will pay you some amount and then they came to him and started working for him and then after that after a few hours he went there and then when he went there he saw some more people standing over there he says you also come and work for me and then so some people work for him from morning to evening some people work for him from afternoon to evening and at the end he paid all of them equally and then those people who worked from the morning they said they protested he worked all day they worked only half day he said that you know you had no job so if i had not employed you you would have got nothing so i have decided that i will pay ev- every one of you are in need i didn't need your work but i engaged you so that i could fulfill your need so it is based on your need that i am giving not on the amount of work that you are doing so he said this is now of course this is not a absolute principle labor ag- unions may agitate against this <laughs> <laughs> but he tells the story to illustrate the principle that god's grace 
is not necessarily, it's reciprocal, but it's not proportional. It's, it's not that because I have done this much service, so Krishna, you have to give me this much result. <laughs> we can't demand like that. Krishna is in that sense. So, so our endeavors, we definitely have to do that. By our endeavors, we show our eagerness, our sincerity, our bhakti to Krishna. But it is not our endeavor that, it, that determines whether we get mercy and how much mercy we get. It is Krishna's sweet will that determines when and how much mercy we get. So, it's causeless in the sense that our endeavor does not determine Krishna's mercy. But it, but it is also still causal in the sense that there is a reciprocal relationship. So, we need to endeavor. Okay. Thank you. So, we can have maybe two more questions if, if there are. I know that you were inspired by questions and uh, this is the time. As I said, life burning questions. So, this is the opportunity. That is. Yes, please. You had mentioned how uh, the karma uh, might not be affecting us, but it could be actually affecting our relatives. Like how you had mentioned in the case of Ravana that uh, his bad influences affect yeah, his correct. Son, you know, son and brothers and uh, yeah. he died. Um, so, so we do know, recognize that it is like a network of karma, uh, mm. at least in the family we are in. Um, so when we are so connected, um, when our karma is in such a state that um, that we are not able to influence the others positively, um, and their negative karma is keeping us not do that, how will this break out? Okay. Suppose, you know, we are in a relationship with someone and we they are doing something bad which is hurting them and hurting us. But we don't have uh, the influence to stop them from doing that. So then how will that end? That's the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. See, um, a lot depends on specifics, but I'll give some broad principles. There is the love that guards and there is the love that guides. That means that love is the same, but say if a small child, if a small maybe two, three year old child goes and uh, maybe while playing a ball breaks a neighbor's window or something like that, window glass. The parents will say that, okay, you know, don't worry about it. We will pay for it. Now, if a child does something wrong, the parents stand next to the child and guard the child from the results. But if a teenager or adult child does something like that, then at that time, it is the love has to guide. If, if the parents keep guarding the child from the consequences of their actions, then what happens? The child will keep doing the wrong thing. So now, of course, the child with the spectra is there, there, but there can be other situations also where guarding others from the consequences of their actions in the name of love is actually a disservice to them. So I was in Connecticut. I had, I had gone to a seminar on spirituality and mental health. It was spirituality and mental health and addictions. It was the whole group of addicts had come there. Addicts and their family members were there. So there was one man who was like a little older, 65, 70. And there was a girl with him who was just like five years old. So then after the class I was talking, they're both Americans. So then after that he came and talked with me and he told me that, that she's his granddaughter. He said that his daughter had become a drug addict. And she was taking more and more drugs and he said she would borrow money from me and never return it. And then I retired and my life savings, one day she broke into my house and stole it all. And then not only that, while she went to get a big haul of drugs, she left her daughter in her home alone and there was some kind of electrical wiring which went off and there was a fire over there. 
So I had to run and save her at that time. So when both of these happened in quick succession, so at that time I decided. Till then, I was trying to help her, support her. But he says, after both of these happened, he says, I, I went and did a court case against her. He said, I filed a complaint against her. And she, she didn't go to jail, but she had to go to like a re-addiction center, penitentiary center. And then I filed for custody of my granddaughter. And at that time, my daughter was so angry with me. She said, what kind of father are you? You are taking my own daughter away from me. You are sending me to jail. She says, now she's in the re-addiction center. And now she is, as she's getting treatment, now she's becoming a little sober. Now she's understanding that what I did for her was good. So at least she was understanding right now. But he said, even after she comes out, she's not going to get her daughter back. Her daughter is going, uh, her, my granddaughter is going to be with me. I've got the custody. So that is an extreme example. But in general, if somebody is an addict, if their addicts are to be counseled, often their fam family members also have to be counseled. And there is a concept called codependency. Codependency means the addicts uh, uh, significant other in their life, they unwittingly start facilitating the addiction, the addict's addiction. So the addict may get drunk or go high and after every episode, their significant other picks up all the pieces. And if they keep doing that, when that person does, is not hit by the consequences of their actions, then they keep doing it more and more and more. So sometimes letting people suffer the consequence of their actions is love. It's, it's painful because there's no easy way. We don't want them to hurt, but we don't want them, us, us to also get hurt. So I'd say these are decisions you have to be taken very carefully. Uh, and uh, depend, as I said, a lot will depend on the specifics. But the principle is that if that particular suffering which we are getting is because of that person's misuse of free will. Then at the very least, we should stop giving them power over us. If, I say, hey, if this person, this, if somebody is somebody the addict and squandering all the money, and then you say, it's my own karma. Well, it's not karma, that's irresponsibility. It requires courage to take a stand. Now, of course, everybody commits mistakes and we can't just... Uh, uh, come thundering down on people for one or two mistakes. But something is being done repeatedly, again and again, and worse and worse degrees. Then, at the very least, we have to create some distance. Now, specifically, how we do that, that will vary. Now, sometimes it might be something different, like somebody is, um, you know, is autistic, or has some other, like, mental health, mental developmental issues because of which they are aggressive, because of which they act in ways that hurt others, hurt others. We understand they are not exactly uh, consciously doing it. Then it's, it's a different dynamic. But we'll have to see the specifics. Broadly speaking, we have to look at things from the perspective of what is the best for that person, but what is also the best for us. Because if we are drowning ourselves in trying to help them, then they will drown and we will also drown. So, it's, it's not selfishness to think of our basic survival needs. That's intelligence. Beyond that, if we start thinking only of ourselves, then that's a problem. It's like, say, it's in airplanes, it is said that, you know, whenever there is an emergency, it says, uh, first put the mask on yourself, then put it on your children. Why? Because if we try to put it on the children first, we might not be able to reach them and fix it. Before that, we might, and they may not be able to put it also. So... There are times when if our very life is itself becoming unbearable, not in the sense of, not in the sense that some, some thing happens and for the next some time we feel very bad about it, but it's repeatedly happening again and again. Then some appropriate action is required. Does that answer your question? <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. So, the one burning question that Ramayana every time comes up that in spite of uh, different uh, concepts, that why the drama with Sita? Okay. So, how yes. Can, okay. Especially for many teenagers, friends. I know, understand. Friends, they ask that question. I understand, yes. 
so why did ram abandon sita i have written a whole book on the ramayana and i have a there's a full uh, article on that and i have a one hour class on this also but i'll not go into that basically uh, i use a acronym cees s e e s to explain this so <clears throat> now first principle over there is that sacrifice so you know it might the at is it that ram was so reputation conscious that because sita was accused just because of that he sent her away now if ram himself was so reputation conscious then for a king to preside without a queen it's not good for reputation at all and he was a powerful king he could have married somebody else he did not marry anyone else so it is not just sita sacrifice it is ram sacrifice also and when Ra another point of the word sacrifice then ram performed those yagyas which grahastha as a as a grahastha king he had to perform the priest told him you need a wife so then he made a golden image of sita and put over there now generally to do sacrifices if you are doing some, we we try to purify we take a bath and we sanctify ourselves so ram personally considered sita so pure that even her effigy could sit next to him so it is not so it was a sacrifice on their part and we say why do a sacrifice like that what's the reason is that somebody makes an accusation because of that you have to give it up that brings us to e is ethical dilemma now there is moral dilemma where two choices are there one is moral the other is immoral then he just needs a uh, strength of character to choose the right option but ethical dilemma is where there are two choices both of them are good or both of them are bad then you have to choose between which is more good or which is less bad so that requires not just strength of character or will power it also requires intelligence discernment so in that case ram was torn between his duty as a husband and his duty as a king so the king had to have a spotless reputation and this is not just indian culture even in in british in in, in in western culture there is idea caesar's wife should be above suspicion now that's so that was it is in the past there was a cultural expectation everywhere so ram had already done what he could he already had sita go to agni pariksha and brahma himself had come and the devta had come and sanctified it even after that if a rumor is spreading what could he do now if he had tried to go go after the people who were doing the rumor that would have seemed like he was so attached that you are abusing your royal power to uh, to uh, to get up get get out us so he chose at that time to give precedence to his duty as a king as compared to duty as father a duty as his as a husband and in one some way that is a very significant example for a country like india where much corruption happens in the form of nepotism nepotism is you know one minister one politician becomes a minister and then the whole ministry is taken over by his family members <laughs> so ram said nothing for myself for the king's post so it's it's a great sacrifice and and so I, although he gave priority to his duty as a king uh, uh, but he did not completely reject his duty as a husband see ram himself was sent to the forest and that is different from sita's being sent to the forest because when ram went to the forest it was out of the kingdom out into the wilderness with nothing and he had to construct his own kutir and stay amid the animals sita was sent to near valmiki's ashram now valmiki's ashram was still in ram's kingdom so indirectly she was still under the protection of sita actually under the protection of ram so as a ethical dilemma and he had, that is the best solution he could come up with in that situation and next e is esoteric explanation esoteric means we need to expand the frame of reference to understand it it is like i whole talk this it was not just the accusation that led to that he described that as in a previous time there was a demon who was terrorizing the devtas and that demon uh was finally attacked by vishnu and while vishnu was chasing after the demon the demon went to the ashram of bhrugurushi and bhrugurushi was not there so his wife khyati was there and he back please say me say and he had come in the garb of a, a nice a uh, pious looking person over there so she said i will protect you i'm like your mother and then vishnu told her begged her 
she told her, you know, he's a terrible demon. And after a big, big time, we have been able to weaken him. And if we don't kill him, he will again become murderous. She says, no, I have surrendered to him. I have given him shelter. I will not let him go. So sometimes, uh, sometimes civilians might shelter a criminal. And then the only way to get to the criminal, the civilians become collateral damage at that time. The, 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 the law enforcers do not want to kill the civilians. But that's what happened with Vishnu. And when Bhrugumuni came back, and he was furious with Vishnu. And he said, just as you, he cursed Vishnu. Just as you have forced me to be separated from my wife, you will be separated from your wife. And that curse uh, was... Now Vishnu, of course, is beyond curses. But he respects Brahmana and Brahminical culture. That's why he voluntarily submits to out of his respect to the Brahminical curses. So he agreed to that. And that's how, that's why he had to be separated from Sita. Madhacharya in his Mahabharata it also tells about another demon who had this, demons are very cunning. So he had a benediction that he said, as long as uh, Vishnu and uh, Lakshmi are united, Narayan and Lakshmi are united, I will not be killed. He has that benediction from uh, Devatas. From, uh, so then, uh, then that's why Ram and Sita had to be separated. And then when they got separated, Indra started attacking him, weakening him. And Indra had to fight for many, many, many years eventually. And then when Indra killed that demon, that's when Ram called Sita back. But by that time, Sita decided to enter into the earth. And of course, from the Gaudiya Vishnu perspective, it's also understood that love in separation is the highest love. That so, Sita, when Ram sent Sita away, it was not a rejection. It was just like Krishna went away from the gopis. It was similar. And <clears throat> if you look at that perspective, it is the dif Lord in different avatars are different things. So, that same Lord Ram, uh, now Ra Ram is demonstrating a particular virtue throughout, and that is selflessness. The whole Ramayana is specialized in the selflessness and how Bharat selflessly kept, sat as a servant below the royal throne, how Lakshman went selflessly. So, this Ram sending Sita away is also an act of selflessness. So, if at all it is to be compared, some people have tried to portray this from a feminist lens that, oh, women were so much exploited and Sita was victimized. Sita is not a victim. Sita is also a very strong character. And uh, so it is like, it's, it is to be compared, it is not that Ram victimized Sita and sent her away. It is rather just as Dashrath had to send Ram away earlier to the forest. Similarly, Ram had to send Sita away to the forest. And just as going to the forest, sending Sita, sending Ram to the forest was painful for Dashrath. Similarly, sending Sita away was painful for Ram. But just as Dashrath and Ram, both of them are heroic in their strength of character, in that doing that sacrifice for a higher cause. Similarly, Ram and Sita are also heroic in their selflessness in doing that particular activity. So, it is that selflessness that is the enduring inspiration of the Ramayana. In India, even if you look at the world today, India has one of the strongest family structures. So, and Ramayana is a book which has influenced Indians for millennia. So, is it the inspiration from the Ramayana that men have become judgmental towards their wives and have abandoned their wives? There's hardly any history like that. But the inspiration that people have taken from Ramayana is the inspiration of selflessness. So, sometimes in scripture, certain virtues are demonstrated in extreme degrees. Now, those extreme degrees ex examples are meant for inspiration, not for standardization. So, just like we can say, Ajam Eli just chanted the name of Vishnu once and he was delivered. Now, does that mean all of us we will do all kinds of nonsense and at the time of death we will chant Vishnu's name? <laughs> no, that extreme example is meant to illustrate a universal principle. And what we should do is focus on the universal principle. Oh, if one chanting of the holy name of Vishnu can have so much potency, how much will regular chanting have? So this is an extreme example and what is the enduring inspiration is not the standardization of the extreme example but the universal principle of selflessness. Okay? Thank you.
हरे कृष्णा Tomorrow in Hindu temple at 10:30, as you know.